germination and factors or conditions necessary for germination. So for you to understand what you will be asked about this, you need to take a look at what germination is. Okay, this is the easy world of science. I'm the easy world science channel. First, if you have not subscribed to this channel, endeavor to do so and click the notification bell. Don't forget to share, like, and comment. Expand this science community. And then, this channel requires your support. We cannot do without you. The little you can offer to us, we will be there to accept that. We need to establish a mini research laboratory. As we offer you this service, there are many things we are running behind. So today, we want to handle you on practical guide, biology practical guide. I'll give you the basic guides, but before I proceed, I want to let you know of someone that I've made this class possible, and the person is a uh, Michael, you know, so he has been a good fellow, he was my student, now he is a partner, of course, when I call him, he answers. So this channel is dedicating this video to him for being a good supporter of this channel. So we have many things behind that we are looking for to make this studio effective. So we need your support in what we call SODA, Society of Air, devoted African scientists because here we just do science because of exams and you are here listening to me because you want to hear me out what I'll tell you what we write and work. If you get a certificate without applying it, what is the need for? So it's high time we wake up and start doing something. So support this channel and support real science. So today as you see in the practical biology, I'll first of all watch till the end. I'm going to handle the difficult aspects, especially the specimen that talks about, talked about uh, giving Providing beakers with soil, have beaker A, I mean beaker D, E, F, and G. Uh, mostly teachers are confused. So this class is for teachers and also for students. So I'll handle that one. Then I'll also give you the guide in biological drawing. If you are em uh, engaged in biological drawing, you are not just drawing like an artist. There are basic things you need to know to end your mark very well. So I'll handle the tough specimen, then give you the guide in drawing. Then with time, I'll also teach you the cheats. In biological drawing. I have some videos that have cheats on biological drawing, drawing of specimens in biology. You can also look it up here on this channel as a majesty's work as you are here. So first, there is sets of specimens where you are required to get four beakers, labels D, E, F, and G. And you are asked to fill in with a given amount of, so I think about 100 to 100 mil each of them to get dry soil. Then to D, E, F, and G, you add 10 mil of water, 10 mil of water, 10 mil of water. Not this one. So this one should be only dry soil. Then to this first one, you are asked to add about five seeds, five bean seeds. Viable, viable, yeah, very important. Viable bean seeds added. I think about five. Then here, you soak the bean seeds in water, remove the test, uh, tester, that is the seed coat, then remove the cotyledon and put here. So, simply, this particular E is still bigger with, uh, with what? Not viable. The seed there is not viable. So, we have viable and not viable, or non viable, or dead. Let's use it. Actually, dead bean. Seeds. Then here you are required to add kerosene. Apart from water, you are also required to add kerosene. Then here, no water. This is just dry soil. So this is to illustrate. Don't get it confused. This particular practica is to teach you nothing but germination. Germination and factors or conditions necessary for germination. So for you to understand what you will be asked about this, you need to take a look at what germination is. Germination is actually the process whereby a seed develops into a plant or a seedling under necessary conditions. The process whereby young plant forms or is developed from a seed is what we call germination. And uh, there are two types of germination. We have epigial germination and hypogeal germination. I'll come back to that when I've handled this. So this particular specimen setup is to discuss the conditions necessary for germination to occur. Now, the conditions are, there will be air, presence of air, or you say presence of oxygen. Then secondly, there have to be presence of water. Then thirdly, optimum temperature. Then the most important is viability of the seed, viable seed. A seed that is still alive, that seed cannot germinate. So when other factors are there, when other conditions are there, but the seed is dead, such seed will never germinate. So, 
looking at this setup, out of this thing I've mentioned, is only optimum temperature that they don't want to demonstrate. So this first particular beaker, D, that contains soil with water, it have that water, there is air, then the seed is viable, then we are told to keep it at a particular room temperature which is enough for a week, so that the dormant stage can be overpowered, the dormancy and germination will take place. So the whole conditions are here. But here, they are trying to tell you the factor of viability. The seed is there already, and every other condition is here. So this thing can never see, there is no germination in this. Then this F, the kerosene is to exclude air. So this one is trying to tell you the factor of oxygen. So this bean seed here will never germinate. Why? Because the kerosene you pour on top of the soil excludes air, that excludes oxygen, and without oxygen there will be germination. Then here the seed will not also germinate as far as you keep it dry because there is no water. That's why they say you shouldn't add 10 ml of water here to make it dry. And in that case, the Soil here is dry soil, so there is oxygen, there is the optimum temperature, the seeds there are viable, but there is no water. But here, every condition is satisfied. So in the Bika D, there is going to be germination, complete germination. So that is it. Now, why am I explaining this is that you might be told, the way they will ask that question, they will give you a little story about this thing I've just said before they can confidently ask you questions. They believe they, if they hide all this information, it, it becomes impossible for them to ask you questions. It will be like because D E F G, they will still give you storyline. This one have oil in it. This one have oil kept in the same condition. I've just told you your, the answers. Then they might tell you to say what is happening in D. What has happened in D is actually germination. State the conditions that favored the process in D. You state what I've just said now, which are optimum temperature presence of air or oxygen, then water or moisture, it must not be actually water in form of liquid, moisture is enough, then viability of the seed. And that's why we are told to put viable seeds here and they will have germinated. So that is it for this setup. Then you might also be told to identify the type of germination that has taken place. Indeed, I told you earlier that the process by which seeds develop to young plants known as seedling in the under favorable conditions is called germination. And we have two types of germination, and those two types are epigeal and hypogeal germination. Epigeal germination and hypogeal germination. I want to teach you science language, because we Africans, we find it difficult to understand science sometimes. Why? Because it is not built on our own local language, such that we usually ask questions on what is telling us the answer already. For example, if a child understands the language from which the word biology is derived from, you cannot even forget the definition. I know you know that one outright because it has become common. The same thing is applicable to other terms that you ask how and why, just because you don't know the origin of the word. The etymology of the words we use and terminologies become so far for us from Africa because science language is based mainly on Greek, Latin, French, and a little bit of English. So in that aspect, I just want to tell you that bio is life, then log logos or logic is just to study. So if one can confidently say biology, you can also define it because the definition is just to explain that term indirectly. So uh, we thank God for those that brought this uh, education. They have systemized the way they name things. They don't just call names. If you say octopus, for example, oct is eight, pus is leg or arms. So octopus, just talking about eight arms. So now, when we say epi, Epi in biology means on top, on top, above, epigeal germination. Then hypo means below or lower than normal. Iso, uniform, equal. So with time, this channel will develop a special class that will be called science language. Endeavor to participate in such class. It will help you very well in medicine. That is where students find it difficult. Because in medical terms, especially in anatomy, become so bogus and bigos that they are finding it difficult. But if you can mention those words correctly, like when they say otorhinolaryngology, someone might get afraid. No. If you say otor, that's ear. Rhino, nose. That's why that particular animal is called rhinoceros, because of that nose. Laryngology is study of throat. So when you say otorhinolaryngology, you are just saying nothing but ear, nose, and throat. So back to what I'm trying to say. I told you that epi is on top, while hypo is below. So when we say epigeal germination, it is a type of germination 
whereby the cotyledons are carried above the soil level. The cotyledons are carried above the soil level. While hypogea, the cotyledons are carried below, below, remember, hypogea. So below, remaining, that, that, that's the germination, keeps the seed on inside the soil. While here, the germination keeps the seed above the soil. So that's why it's called epigeal germination. Then the one that you will observe in the examination hall should be epigeal germination because bean seeds actually undergo epigeal germination. How? You will notice it that the seeds, but after germination, we don't just call it seed again. Those things remain as actually cotyledons. The cotyledons are pushed above the soil level. So diagrammatically, you have that. To illustrate this, if here is our cotyledon, I'm giving a sketch of a young plant known as seedling. So a newly germinated plant is referred to as seedling. Okay. See, this is our drawing. This was formed from the plumule, called a young plumule. Then this was actually formed from the radical. So this one is the shoots, and here is the root system. Hi, my name is Cheryl, and I'm Jennifer. Guess, Guess what? what? There's a channel called Star Majesty Easy World Science. And you know the best part? Mm -hmm. It makes science so wow. It makes science easy, simplified, and very, very fun. Guess what? Rocky science isn't rocky science anymore. It's now ABC, like if you did science. <laughs> Another thing about Sir Majesty is the World Science Channel is that he makes available laboratory equipment and reagents. Guess the best part if chemistry has been hard for you, he does tutorials. And another thing is when you order for these things, they are high quality and they are also cheap and affordable for anybody. If you want to order, just look at number below the screen. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the little notification button down below. Don't forget to share, of course, obviously, there's love in sharing. Thank, Thank you. you! We'll see you there. <laughs> then, this is our cotyledon, seedling. If you open your bean seed, it opens into two. So let's assume this is the bean seed. Remember, you are required to remove the embryo of that of this to make sure that there is no form of germination that will occur. If you open it, these two things are just cotyledons. So there are two cotyledons here, and that's why we call it dicotyledon. There are two seed leaves. Now, after germination, this is our cotyledon. We are going to take a look at two parts of this seed There are two parts. The one below the cotyledon and the one above the cotyledon. If you remember the science language I used, I say that epi is on top and hypo is below. So if I use the word epicotyl and hypocotyl, Let's assume this is A and this is B. Either of them is hypocotyl and the other is epicotyl. Test your ability. Which one do you think is epicotyl? The word cotyl, short form of cotyledon. So epicotyl means on top of cotyledon. So if they tell you epigynous flower, those flowers that have the floral parts on top of the ovary because the ovary is the female and hence the gyne. So on top of ovary epigynous. So when I say epicotyl, this part above the cotyledon is the what? Epicotyl. Did you get it? Then, this one below is called the hypocotyl. Now, I want to describe the mechanism of epigeal germination. Here, if the hypocotyl grows faster than the epicotyl, you know what it means? It means that it's going to push this cotyledon out of the soil. And that type of germination is called epigeal germination. So, in epigeal germination, the hypocotyl grows faster than epicotyl. I'm taking biology in details because I know I might not see you again. So you take this opportunity to learn biology very, very well. God bless you and don't forget to share my content and support us. Okay? I say that in epigeal germination that the hypocotyl grows faster than what? The epicotyl, thereby pushing this cotyledon above the soil. Then the other alternative is the hypogea. So in hypogea germination, the epicotyl grows faster than the hypocotyl. Because of that, it is not the epicotyl that pushes the cotyledon out. Rather, it's the hypocotyl. So if epicotyl is growing faster, it shows that this seed 
Now, this seed leaf, or cosmic will remain inside the soil, and that's what we call hypogea. You see it now. So, in epigea germination, what do you think? Hypo hypocotyl grows faster than epicotyl, but in hypogea germination, the epicotyl grows faster than the hypocotyl, and this helps to keep the Sit, uh, the cotyledon inside the world, soil. So the soil level is our determinant. In the case of uh, epigeal germination, it often occurs in this form. You see that the, the seedlings have not released see the, the long leaves forming in this form, you see it this way. So that shows that the seedling has been brought out. So this is the soil level. Or in some cases, you might see the leaf in this case. This has brought out, this is what we call epigeal germination because of what? The seedling. This is the cotyledon it brought out. Then this one I drew here is usually used to represent hypogeal germination. So the seedling have a cotyledon that remains inside the soil. And I think the hypogeal germination is common for the monocotyledons. But dicotyledons, most of them have epigeal germination. So that is it for specimen D, E, F, and G. Then, just in case, they might also take to the essence of percentage water. No, they shouldn't do that one because this is actually keen on germination. And I think I've given you the information still about germination. Then other specimen, they, they provided the cervical vertebra. Uh -huh. Assuming you are asked to study that, thoracic vertebra, lumbar vertebra, can do yourself a favor by watching my anatomy videos here where you can even see that of humans where I use the real life human vertebra, the real life human bones to teach anatomy to higher institution students. You can also do you good. But here, yeah, I've also done this with lower animal. I use that of a rabbit. Check my video here. Check it very well. You see a video that contains lumbar vertebra, thoracic vertebra, cervical vertebra, equally the scapula just trying to treat some parts of rabbit skeleton. So, but I'll still handle them. What are we expecting here? They are all found in the backbone. They are found in the vertebral column. And being a bone, being one of the bones in the vertebral column, their function is similar. They usually protect the spinal cord. But their locations are different. Cervical vertebra is located in the neck in the neck region. So cervical vertebra is located in the neck region. Remember, all mammals have seven bones in the neck region, except few of them, the edendita or the xenatra, such as the sloths and the armadillo, and hence their name xenatra, meaning extra. But if you are a mama, despite the, the length of your neck, you still have seven. Be it as tall as giraffe, you are still seven. Even the whales have seven bones in their neck. Then. They say cervical vertebra. They are not specific. The first cervical bone is called atlas. The second is called axis. Then from number three to number seven are called normal or ordinary cervical. But they just say cervical vertebra. What does it mean? We will learn features that are common to all cervical bones. So all cervical bones have a distinguishing feature in them, and that is what we call vertebratarial canal. The distinguishing feature of cervical bone Every cervical bone have a vertebratarial canal. They are the only group of bones that have it. If you don't call it vertebratarial canal, you can call it a transverse canal. Yes, of course, the transverse canal. It is unique to only the bones in the neck. And bones in the neck are called cervical vertebra. Hi, my name is Chemeke Arize. I'm a third year medical student, and I am here to tell you to subscribe to Sir Majesty Easy World, or science is fun. Therefore, what's the function of this? It provides passage for blood vessels and nerves that supplies the head. That's the function of the vertebratarial canal. So when they talk about the cervical bone, to compare it with a lumbar vertebra, at least you now see the tabular form there. You see that there is presence of a vertebratarial canal in the cervical bone, absence of vertebrata canal in thoracic is also absent in lumbar. So the distinguishing feature of that specimen is presence of vertebrata canal. Then other features of cervical bones are, number one, presence of centrum or body except atlas. Se uh, number three, probably because this should be number one, then presence of centrum should be number two. Then number three, 
presence of a neural spine but not prominent, then presence of transverse uh, process, then presence of neural canal for passage of spinal cord. The neural canal is different from vertebral canal. They provide passage for spinal cord. That's the central hole. When you watch this video, I'm telling you, you will see the real life illustrations so that you get to understand what I'm saying very, very well. Then, the other thing is this. You might be told to draw this specimen. Like I told you, I'll have a special video for this special specimen. So, these bones has been settled and their locations differ. Thoracic is in the back of your chest, lumbar, the back of your belly, that's your abdomen, and the lumbar vertebra is the most stout vertebra. So lumbar vertebra have extra processes such as metapophysis, anapophysis, and hypophysis. Yes, some rabbits have it, though not all their lumbar have it. Some special, I don't think, I have not taken time to check the number, but I discovered that in a particular rabbit, not all the lumbar have uh, this uh, hypophysis. But what is constant in all the lumbar vertebra is metapophysis. So, you see the structures and the work of the lumbar vertebra is that it bears majority of the body weight. It's the most massive and stout vertebra. Why? Because it occupies the center of gravity of your body. It prevents sagging in the posture of tall people. You know what I mean by sagging? Where someone is walking in this way. So boys now mimic that sag by pulling their long pants down, but that's not it. Then it also supports pregnancy in women, of course. So it is the lumbar vertebra that enables women to carry a baby that is heavy for months. If not, if not the lumbar, they will fall back. So we have seen the functions of the lumbar vertebra, apart from provision of passage for spinal cord and protection, just like a, a majority of the bones of the vertebra, uh, vertebra column. Then the other one, thoracic, is just thoracic vertebra have the longest and the most prominent neural spine, or what we call spinous process, to compare to each size. If you touch the back, you touch the center of your back, starting from your neck, you, you see a projection, and that's what we call spine. So this does the collection and the overlap of the neural spine of the vertebral bones. Remember, for humans, there are up to 33 bones. Not up to, there are 33 separate bones, but 26. There are 33 total bones, but 26 separate bones in our own. But what you are asked to provide is that of lower mama. Uh, let me just take it, I'm advising the younger one. So if you check that my anatomy, that's where we focus more on humans. So the thoracic vertebra helps in the formation of the rib cage by providing articulation with the ribs, then together with the sternum, the ribs, and the, verte uh, the thoracic vertebra, this rib cage is formed. And the function of the rib cage is to protect the heart and the lungs, which are delicate. And they also help in breathing. So the longer neural spine provides extra process for attachment of all muscles. So remember, you might be asked to compare and contrast between each of the specimens provided for you. Then some conflicts were asked to study about cactus, uh, onion, plants, and a grass species, I think maybe Ghanaians, of course. Just know that cactus is a xerophyte, is a, is a desert plant, is a drought-resistant plant, and when we use the word cactus, they are just, is a common name for the members of the Cactaceae family, the Cactaceae family. There are many of them. There are, there are about 120-something species, uh, uh, something families, and we thought up to 1,000, but when they don't say cactus, you see it there on the screen, those ones, these are just what we call cactus. Not that they, there is this particular thing that bears the name cactus. So cactus, there are many, but just know that their common feature is that they usually have their seed, uh, uh, leaves reduced to spine. They have thick succulent stem, which is a feature of all the xerophytes. They are meant to resist drought. Then remember, you will be asked to compare it with that grass. The grass species you see is just a mesophyte, ordinary land plant. It cannot withstand harsh weather, arid conditions. So if you are told to compare the two, it's very simple. In similarity, both are greenish, of course. Both are photosynthetic. Both the cactus, the onion, that's allium sepa, the onion plant, and uh, the grass species. For Ghanaians, that's the people I'm talking to now. So then, if you are asked to differentiate, in differentiating between any specimen in practical, use your practical thinking. It's a simple thing. Biology is not something that is far-fetched. It's within your doorsteps. It's the study of life. And the you that is studying it is a spaceman. You are alive. And those things around you are alive. You have been encountering all these things. So when you are asked to do something, stop neglecting your ability. When you look around these two spacemen, let's assume you are asked to differentiate between cactus and grass. Just say spine is present in cactus, spine absent in grass, spindle-shaped leaves in grass, absence of spindle-shaped leaves, 
There is, in the whole grass, there is a perfect root system. I'm sure the cactus they are going to provide for you will not have it. So these are the things, thick succulent stem present in that of cactus, then absence of thick succulent stem. Then remember that the onion is a ball and is a means of vegetative propagation. Okay? Then other specimen is all about insects. Butterfly, name them, these ones are all about insects. You see what and what I expected from them on the screen. I love you. Thank you for watching.